All right. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Tonight, we're going to look at a new sutta. Uh, tonight, we are still going to be looking at the Majjhima Nikaya, the middle length discourses. Tonight, we're going to be looking at sutta number 39. Uh, this is called the Maha Asapura Sutta, the longer discourse given at Asapura. Uh, this is still from a section of the Majjhima Nikaya. It's called um, the section on pairs. And you might remember this from a few Dharma doors ago, that these are all like the larger and the smaller sutta either on different topics or like tonight, it's these two suttas, a longer and a shorter sutta that were both given in a town called Asapura. So they're called the Asapura Sutra. So there's not much more to it than where it was given. I wanted to do this sutta tonight though. To, this sutta is one of those suttas that you know, who who has who has studied or taught the Asapura Sutra? It's not one of the most popular sutras in that way. But the reason why I wanted to do this sutra tonight is because it's like a classic sutra. <laughs> and I don't mean that again. I don't mean it's a classic, like it's one of the Buddha's greatest hits. What I mean is, is that tonight, this is just a classic good old sutra is <laughs> it's sort of just like kind of everything a sutra should do in that way um there's going to be a lot of ideas that we've already talked about that we talk about often so it's going to be a repeat in that way of like some information but there's one topic like one kind of main idea that comes right at the beginning and it's kind of what I wanted to center tonight's Dharma talk around. So, um, yeah, so it comes right at the beginning. So we'll, we'll dive into it. And then I'm not going to do a reading of this sutra in its entirety. We're going to take it section by section and like talk about each of the sections. Um, so once again, what the sutra we're talking about is sutra number 39, if you happen to have the big wisdom publication edition, I'm on page 362. Um, yeah, so let's go ahead and get into it so we can kind of start talking about a couple of interesting topics. So this sutra starts, of course, like all sutras start. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living in the Angan country at a town of the Angans, Angans, named Asapura. There the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus, venerable sir, they replied. And the Blessed One said this. Shramanas, Shramanas, recluses, recluses, Bhikkhus, that's how people perceive you. And when you are asked, what are you? You claim that you are shramanas, recluses. Since that's what you are designated and what you claim to be, you should train thus. We will undertake and practice those things that make one a shramana, a recluse, that make one a brahmana, a brahmin, so that our designations may be true and our claims genuine, and so that the services of those whose robes, alm food, resting place, and medicinal requisites we use shall bring them great fruit and benefit and so that our going forth shall not be in vain, but fruitful and fertile. <clears throat> All right, I want to spend just a moment. So this sutra is about what, what it means to be a shramana, or in Pali, this samana, samanya. 
this is again it's a Pali word but it's a Sanskrit word and it's a word that you hear a lot in Buddhist sutras and it's a word this word shramanya or again samanya it's a word that you hear a lot for a Buddhist monk or a nun but what we need to know or what is important to know is that this particular word, sh shramana, is a very old kind of Indian idea. It's a term or a word that you find in the Vedas, in the Upanishads. So we're talking about kind of, you know, philosophical religious literature of India from 2000 BC, 1000 BC, like very old literature. So what we need to know is, is that this word is not just a Buddhist word. It's kind of a very common word. And I, I want to unpack what it means. And then we'll get into like the sutra, because what the sutra is saying is the Buddha is saying, other people call all of you shramanas and you in fact you call yourselves a shramana and so you should be a good shramana and the sutra is about what it means to be a good shramana or a recluse so again what i want us to kind of understand is is that i guess the way that you could think of it you could think of it this way in terms of the early form of Buddhism, represented by the Pali Canon, represented by these sutras, you could say that all of the bhikkhus, all of the monastics, male and female, you could say that they are all shramanas. But not all shramanas are Buddhist. In other words, a shramana is like a designation for somebody who has left society, it's where you get the language of a recluse or a renunciant. And there's a lot of different, I've, I have found a lot of different <clears throat> etymologies of the word samanya in Pali or shramana in Sanskrit. There does seem to be, at least in the more the, the Pali Buddhist leaning use of the word, there does seem to be a kind of a relationship with shamatha, that idea of like equalizing. So if you know the prefix or this sam, the kind of the root prefix of this idea is sam, uh, similitude, sameness. And so it could be that the shramanas were doing a lot of shamatha, a lot of that type of calming, equalizing meditation. It could be that their lifestyle was very equal in that way. So the actual like etymology of the word, like what does that word shramana mean? Mm, it seems kind of debated, but what it designated what it indicated seems to be very agreed upon. A shramana, again, is someone who is a, well, they have renounced society. That's a very kind of important aspect of what it would mean to be a shramana. And of course, early Buddhists all renounced society. Now, there's one other word really quickly that's going to come up in the sutra, and it's this word brahman. And in terms of the language, it's important to note, it, note that in the exact same way that it's a samanya in Pali, a, a practitioner of that shramana lifestyle, a samanya, it's also called a brahmanya. Now, we know it as a brahman, but I just want you to know that these are sort of Similar designations, a samanya and a brahmanya. Now, what is a brahman? This is where we're, you're going to find a lot of different understandings of that word. If you were to ask me, I kind of can imagine 
like several, maybe four or five major different interpretations of that word Brahman. Now, the first one that comes to mind, it might be the first one that comes to your mind, is that you might be aware that in India, there is this thing known as the caste system, right? It's this kind of social hierarchy. And it's a very old class system that has been in place in India for, you know, way before the time of the Buddha. In that caste system, which is kind of like this pyramid system of uh, society, at the top of the pyramid are the Brahmins, sometimes called the priestly class. So the very first thing is a Brahmin, meaning the caste, the highest of the caste order system. We're not talking about that actually tonight. That idea that the Brahmins are at like the top of this social order, that's like it. That's like its own thing in a way. And it's kind of in a way what we're, we're not here to talk about. So I just want you to know that there's that, the social hierarchical designation of a Brahmin. We're not talking about that. Now, where that designation or where that idea of a Brahmin kind of comes from is from a certain uh, religious priestly type person or it's a function in society in Indian society of basically kind of performing rituals performing rites you might make a puja a fire ritual and then you would actually perform a kind of ritual on someone's behalf or just on behalf of the universe in terms of like maintaining universal order that's also not what we're talking about tonight. <laughs> now that idea of a like a Brahmin priest who's doing puja rituals and all of that, that kind of comes from an, an even earlier idea of a Brahmin, which is it was basically anybody who was involved in what is known as Brahmacharya, the Brahma practice. And so if you were a Brahmacharyan, a practitioner of the ways of Brahma, that would make you a Brahmin. But what is Brahmacharya? Well, the simplest kind of way of speaking about a Brahma, like what is it, what is it to do the practices of Brahma? The main practice of a Brahmacharyan is celibacy, is maintaining that sexual energy and the idea is is that maintaining like basically being celibate makes one kind of spiritually pure which is what then puts you in a position to do rituals that are effective as a brahmin so you're kind of maybe noticing now this progression from a kind of a a religious spiritual practice called brahmacharya that makes one a brahmin so that you could do rituals and then that eventually becomes the highest of this caste order but i want you to know that there's an even like deeper meaning to all of that and what we kind of need to access is we need to understand that brahma is a god is like this very old Indian idea of a creator god. Brahma, now, oh, and by the way, a, a quick word on, so Brahma, or is it Brahma? <laughs> this idea of like how to pronounce Brahma or Brahma. I've watched so many different videos of different people telling me the right way to pronounce this. And I keep going, oh, okay, I'll pronounce it this way. Oh, I'm pronouncing it wrong. I'll pronounce it this way. So I'm here to tell you that I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce this B-R-A-H-M-A, -A, Brahma or Brahma. <laughs> you would think the H comes before, but I have heard that the 
the sandhi or the kind of elision of words is the other way around. But again, don't take my word for any of pronunciation of Sanskrit. What we need to know, though, <clears throat> is that this word, Brahma, is like the name of this creator god. But this creator god, at least in the Buddhist understanding, is the god of the realm of form, the meaning the realm of just pure materiality. No... Um, psychodramatic sphere of desire. That's the realm of Indra. Indra is the god of the realm of desire, sexuality, music, the arts, fine food, fl flavors and smells, like all the kind of sensual stuff of the realm of desire. That's all Indra's realm. But if you get down to like the building blocks of reality, that's the realm of Brahma. And basically what it is, is, is that, and I'm about to create a link now between that idea of Brahmacharya, of like celibacy. The idea is, is that the mind that is sort of like turned on in that way, a mind that is sort of sexually stimulated is participating in playing in the realm of desire. And the idea is, is that if you want to access this deeper realm of pure form, the realm of Brahma, well, your mind kind of can't be in that realm of desire. You need to kind of calm down and kind of equalize, shamatha. And that idea of calming down and equalizing brings you into the realm of Brahma just this realm of pure form where everything is very even. No big highs, no big lows. I'm talking about no, like, you know, it's not super exciting, but it's not really depressing and sad either. It's just the realm of form and it's very calm. It's very peaceful. It's very still. And that's the realm of the meditator. That's the realm of jhana. That's the realm of this deeper meditation. So the idea is, is that the early Buddhists were very much into the idea of sort of transcending the realm of desire and just abiding in the realm of pure form, Brahma's realm. And so early Buddhists were Brahmacharyans and they were known as Brahmins. But they were Brahmins because they were like Brahm, Brahmites, Brahma, Brahmites, if you will. Like they were just into that realm of Brahma. So those two things, by the way, being a Samanya or a Shramana and being a Brahmin, those are actually two different things. Those are two different designations. And actually what's interesting about it is that in normally a, a samanya or a shramana is off in the woods. They're alone, they're recluses, they're just solitary dwellers usually. Whereas a, a Brahmin is kind of engaged with society in a way, normally, and that gets me around to what the Buddha was talking about at the end of this first paragraph where he mentions you all who call yourselves shramanas, well, you should all train in the way I'm about to tell you how to train so that your, so that what you say about yourself, so that your designations might be true. And so that your claims about yourself are true and that way, the services that you're given, the, the robes and the alms food and the resting places and the medicine, if you practice right, it'll bring benefit to the people that give those things to you. And that's the kind of social exchange I'm talking about that kind of is a more Brahmini thing to be involved in. But don't get too attached to these terms because they're really at least they're, the way they're being used in this text, 
they're more like adjectives than nouns. Like these are not job descriptions or titles. It's more of just adjectives of the way they are. All right, so any questions about, sure, yeah, no, please. Happy to answer. Um, so this is about a question about the the sort of uh, that you, that you will be so that the material the gifts that you get will in turn give advantage to the people who give them to you, and that's that idea of like the monks, like that's the idea of making merit, right? The people give you something in exchange for your being holy, which then gives them merit. So the Buddha is kind of saying like, if, if you're not actually doing what you say you're doing, then the people aren't going to get the merit. And that's like unfair or something. something. Excellent yeah. summary. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Excellent summary. Yep. Thanks. Okay. And that, and and again, um, Noam, your summary is totally great because it emphasizes the real point of this sutra, which is this sutra is about how to be a proper shramana, a proper Brahmin. And that if you were that way, you will be, yes, you'll be a proper field of blessings, as they're called, right? A punya kshetra. Okay. Now, the way this sutra is going to work. And I'll just read the first of these, but these are a series of sections that build upon each other. But the first one reads like this. And what bhikkhus are the things that make one a, a samanya, a shramana, that make one a brahmin? Bhikkhus. You should train thus. Thinking. We shall be possessed of self-respect and fear of wrongdoing. Now, bhikkhus, you might think this way. We are possessed of self-respect and fear of wrongdoing. That much is enough. That much has been done. The goal of recluseship has been reached. There's nothing more for us to do. And you may rest content with that much. Bhikkhus, I inform you, I declare for you, you who seek the recluse's status, you who seek the status of a shramana, do not fall short of the goal of recluseship, while there is more to be done. And then the next paragraph is going to begin, and what more is to be done? But let's start with the basics. So, the basic here, this verse section, is this idea that a bhikkhu who considers themselves a shramana should have hiri. This is, it's called, it's, well, H-I-R-I. Hiri and opat, what is it? Otappa. I'm more familiar with the Sanskrit, which is hiri apatrapya. And you usually see this as like one idea, even though it's two different words. So it's like hiri apatrapya or hiri otapata or something like that. Now, the reason why I wanted to do this sutra is because I wanted to talk about the way this these words are usually translated. And then I kind of want to go through it with you because the way that at least, well, sometimes hri or hiri and sometimes apatrapya, either of them are often translated as shame, sometimes even guilt. And I wanted to, you know, talk about this directly because it's my understanding that those are kind of very problematic translations of these ideas. So allow me to break this down. By the way, I first encountered these two ideas of khri and apatrapya. I first encountered them as part of the bodhisattva path. And for a very long time, I thought they were kind of 
an exclusive part of the Bodhisattva path because it's spoken about so often. But only after you know really digging through the Pali Canon did I realize, oh no, the Buddha's talking about these two all the time. Well, what are these? Well, let's start with the first one. So this is in Pali. Again, it's H-I-R-I, Hiri. Or in Sanskrit, it's just Kri, like H-R-I-H, I guess. And the word, basically, I prefer the, the main definition of it that you'll find in a Sanskrit dictionary is either dignity or self-respect. Now, actually, let, let's talk about both of these together. So what it is, is, is that apatrapya, apatrapya is this sort of like, well, it's translated as the idea of a, a fear of wrongdoing. That's actually even how Bhikkhu Bodhi translates it in here, is a fear of wrongdoing. So if we take those two ideas, and, and here they're translated, of course, as shame and a fear of wrongdoing. And the fear of wrongdoing is what is often sometimes even translated as guilt. So you have these ideas of shame and guilt. Oh, oh, like such terrible ideas. So what we're talking about here, and the way that I learned this, again, I've learned this more from the Mahayana Bodhisattva tradition, but it, the definitions still hold. You can begin by thinking of it that both of these, both of these have to do with like morality and, you know, transgressing against precepts, kind of doing wrong things or akushala dharma, unwholesome dharmas. It has to do with that. And the way that you can think of it, it's the way I think of it, it's the way it was taught to me. Kri or Hiri is sort of about the past. And it's about everything in a way that you've done, so to speak. And then you in this very moment and the way that you relate to the things that you have done. And that's the idea is, is it's about having this kind of dignity or self-respect that what I've done in the past is good, is wholesome, is proper, is correct. All of these ideas. It's kind of the idea of like, I can, I can sleep well at night because I've, I've done good in that way versus a kind of, and I wouldn't call it shame or shamelessness in that way, but what it is, is, is the opposite of khi or hiri is not reflecting at all on past behavior, <clears throat> like not really caring about it at all. So I just want to put out that out there. I'm going to have a lot more to say about both of these, but so you can understand now where it's tempting for some, I suppose, to translate this as shame because it's about having this kind of like, you know, not feeling good about the things you've done in the past. And we kind of call that shame, but here's the thing that I want to say, and I should say it now before I forget. When I first encountered this idea of guilt and shame in Buddhism, I, of course, put my hands to my face and was like, oh, no, like not in Buddhism, too. So I want you to know that I had that reaction. And after I started studying it, though, I had a kind of a realization about about like what we would call per perhaps call shame. But I had a realization about that idea of reflecting on past actions versus not reflecting on past actions. And what I realized was <clears throat> that, <clears throat> call it guilt for now, but that sense of, of, of guilt or whatever, that sense that I've done something wrong, 
If you don't have that, you're lost. You're totally lost. There's, it's hopeless at that point. And what I mean is I, it's about, oh, I now have compassion for people that don't have that type of reflection because they're, how could they make progress? And at that point, that kind of call it a moral conscience, all of a sudden that moral conscience is like your best friend, your great teacher in that way. And again, just reflect upon <clears throat> the, the mentality that lacks that type of reflection. I think we call those people sociopaths <laughs> because you have, don't have any reflection on the past. And it's also the, the, this, this one that we're working on right now, this idea of hri, hri or hiri, it's about this like, um, uh, or what I want to get at is, is that if you don't have it, then you have this sort of like, um, no responsibility for one's past actions is what I'm getting at in that way. And so I totally understand the problems with like Catholic guilt and Catholic shame and like all of these like terrible emotionalities that are part of Western culture. I understand them. And that's why I would want to shy away from the language of guilt and shame. But tonight I would like us to kind of reflect upon what what those things are pointing at. So <clears throat> the first aspect of being a shramana in that way is having this kind of hiri, a reflection upon past actions. Now, apatrapya, the other one, the way I was taught it, the way I learned it, is that that one's about the future. And in particular, it's about the potential or the possibility of future immorality, future transgressions against the precepts and things like that. And that's where they kind of call it having a fear of wrongdoing or having a uh, conscientiousness is sometimes a translation of apatrapia, <clears throat> being considerate. But it's all sort of future oriented. And in particular, again, the emphasis is about a kind of um, a fear of wrongdoing. And I want to kind of, again, I want to contrast that with a mentality that doesn't care about morality in that way, that it's just not a concern of theirs. Like, you know, maybe tonight I'll you know, massacre a bunch of bugs because, uh, you know, there's an infestation in my house. And so I got to kill all these sentient beings. One mentality would be like, oh, whatever. There's no kind of reflection upon that as maybe bad. Now, you might still, you might still have to fumigate in that way out of a kind of utilitarian higher good for the protection of the family. But my point is, is that as a Buddhist or a Buddhist practitioner, you could do that mindfully and you could do it compassionately and you could do it aware of the fact that it's not good that I'm killing all these beings. I'm doing it for the you know health and welfare of my family and the health and welfare of my environment, but I'm not ignorant that it would be best if I didn't do this. <clears throat> I just want you to contrast that with a mind that doesn't think about it one way or the other. Like, in other words, the morality, there is no morality. It's sort of just about my comfort at that point. So a recluse, a shramana in this way has Hiri and apatrapya has this sort of self-respect or dignity and this concern about future wrongdoing and wanting to avoid it in that way. 
Now, these two in the tradition, these two things, Hiri and Apatrapya, these two are called the Lokapalas, the guardians of the world. And again, what I would ask you to think about is, where would we be if nobody had either of these things? Yeah, it's scary to think. And at that point, when you think of it that way, of like, oh my gosh, what if nobody had remorse? What if nobody had conscience? Yeah, the world would be gone. So these two are indeed the protectors of the world in a way. And they're the basis of this shramana practice of being a Brahman, of being a field of blessing. Now, bhikkhus, you might think it's enough to just have remorse and conscience in that way. And so that's where this starts is this idea of like, so you might think that that much is enough. That much has been done. The goal of recruitship has been reached, right? Just because I'm a conscientious person, right? But there's more to be done. What more is to be done? Bhikkhus, you should train thus, thinking our bodily karma, our bodily conduct shall be purified clear and open, flawless and restrained, and we will not laud ourselves and disparage others on account of that purified bodily conduct. Now, bhikkhus, you might think thus, we are possessed of dignity and fear of wrongdoing, and our bodily conduct has been purified. That much is enough. That much has been done. The goal of recluseship has been reached. There's nothing more for us to do. And you may rest content with that much. But bhikkhus, I inform you, I declare to you, you who seek the recluse's status do not fall short of the goal of recluseship while there is much more to be done. So, we now move to the idea of it's not just about this sort of um, like not having done bad things in the past and therefore having this kind of self-respect, being conscious of future actions and avoiding wrongdoing in the future. So it's not just about that, but that's a foundation. If you don't have that, you're not really going to be able to purify bodily conduct. Now, within the world of Buddhism, of course, there's many definitions of what it means to purify bodily conduct, but we are primarily talking about not, not killing, not stealing. And since this is kind of more of a monastic sutra in that way, this is for the re renunciants, the recluses, we will add to that then that the purified bodily conduct is usually about avoiding intoxicants and also celibacy in the traditional sense or in the traditional practice. So those four are sort of the four main aspects of purified bodily conduct, right? Again, not being violent to the, certainly to the point of killing, not stealing, and then intoxicants and sexuality in that way. Now, the idea would be that you might think, but okay, I'm remorseful, I'm conscious, conscious, and I am bodily purified. I haven't killed anything, haven't stolen anything, haven't drank anything, haven't had sex for a while. I'm pure, right, right Buddha? Like, I'm done, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> what more is to be done? Because you should train thus our verbal karma, our voice karma, our verbal conduct shall be purified, clear and open, flawless and, un and restrained. And we will not laud ourselves and disparage others on account of that purified verbal conduct. 
And then we have a, a repetition of the same formula, but, but bhikkhus, you shouldn't think just because you're purified in verbal conduct, bodily conduct, and khri and apatrapya, don't think you've done it. There's more to do. So verbal conduct, of course, is about truth speaking, not using harsh speech. It's about be, have, using kind speech. <clears throat> It's just all the various ways that we use our voice and that the way that we can use our voice can be harmful or it can be beneficial. A real quick, just a real quick note. So these are all, or at least many of the next ones coming and the last one. So talking about bodily conduct and vocal verbal conduct, it describes them as, as being clear and open and flawless and restrained. So clear and open, like what, what could that mean? Bodily conduct, clear and open. Well, I always just think of the opposite and then wonder about that. And so the idea of like not clear and not open. So that would be closed in that way. In terms of things like bodily conduct, to be closed about bodily conduct, for me, the way that I read that and understand that is a kind of, um, you know, a sort of um, hiding in that way. So yeah, you've stolen something, but you're also sort of doing it on the sly and you're not like really telling people about it. So it's just sort of your own little personal secret in that way. <clears throat> That's being closed versus sort of being open, very transparent in that way. Even today, nowadays, we use that language, a lot of transparency, being open about your conduct in that way. So that's the way I understand the idea of kind of, oh, and then being clear versus kind of being cloudy in that way, being mixed in that way. <clears throat> so a recluse is clear and open with body and speech. <clears throat> flawless, flawless of course is basically what it means in that way where it's about not slipping up in that sense. It's, if, you, if one has taken a vow of sobriety, let's say, then to be flawless in that is to maintain sobriety. <laughs> it's not to be sober six days of the week. <laughs> that would be kind of flawed in a way, incomplete versus what we're talking about. And then restrained. All of these are also described as restrained. In general, what I would say about that, and, and that's going to line up with things that are about to come, my understanding of that idea of having restraint in bodily conduct, restraint in verbal conduct, <clears throat> let's take verbal conduct as a good example. N nowadays, nowadays we use the language of having no filter, right? Like people who just whatever they think, whoop, comes out of the mouth. <clears throat> that is unrestrained. Unrestraint is just whoop. Whereas restraint would be about a recluse, a shramana, a bhikkhu, who thinks about what they're going to say and thinks about the repercussions of what they will say. Is this harsh? Is this true? Is this beneficial? Is this idle? So it's one of my favorite aspects of like uh, wrong speech in Buddhism, idle speech. I love that that's sort of like, not, it's not good to just sort of like yammer on in that way. So to reflect upon that and then speak, that would be having restraint to not just reaching out um, for what you want, but thinking for a moment about it 
is restraint of body. And then what we're going to come to, and I should probably get there before things get too late. We come to what you, excuse me. We come to what you probably expected was next. What more is to be done? Well, bhikkhus, you should train thus. Our mental karma, our mental conduct shall be purified, clear and open, flawless and restrained, and we will not laud ourselves and disparage others on account of that purified mental conduct. But of course, that's not all. <clears throat> so, these, of course, are the three sources of karma, the body, the speech, and the mind. And traditionally, these are spoken about, of course, as the, like, the most kind of gross, by which I mean obvious form of karma, is physical karma. Vocal karma is a little more subtle, a little more like, where is it? Where is speech? Huh, it's very subtle speech, but not as subtle as thought. Where are thoughts? Hmm. And what they say is, regarding karma, what you think is what you talk about, and what you talk about is what you do. In other words, there's like a bubbling up or a manifestating of your reality. And karmically, it all begins with the thoughts, which turn into speech, which turn into action. And so having this kind of clear, open, flawless, restrained, purified mental action. Now, what's really interesting about having restrained mental karma well, a moment ago, I just mentioned that it would be probably a good thing to think about what you're going to say before you say it. Well, in a lot of yoga traditions, they often say, think before you think. And so that's an even subtler one where you are being careful about what you're thinking about having restraint of thought, very subtle in that way. But what we would like to notice is, is that restraint of thought helps with that restraint of speech, which helps with the restraint of the body. So, all right, any questions so far about the buildup here of these ideas? And I didn't mention it before, you know, this this is a, you know, a sutra for uh, shramanas, right? Uh, recluses, renunciants, bhikkhus. But I wanted to mention that I still think there is a tremendous amount of wisdom here for householders. In fact, I haven't really heard anything yet that is, you know, it's in the sutra. You could interpret it in a more monastic way. But what it has said is, I think, equally applicable to kind of all stations of life in that way. Noe. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, it, 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 it says, it's, I'm reading the precepts or the foundation of the precepts. They're all right here. <clears throat> Slowly as, I, as I'm, you know, of course, reading, you know, it's like, oh, well, this is the foundation of the precepts for later in the Mahayana. Yep. In the Bodhisattva path, we make these vows to these precepts and to do the best we can with them. And, and just something uh, about the, when earlier, um, the word uh, resentment came to mind, as the word resent means to refeel hmm. in French. So how this is talking hmm. about, you know, <laughs> when you were talking earlier about shame and, and wrong and you know, and i understand the way you presented it of course but there was something here that just that word resentment came up it's like, oh to refeel so i'm mentally hanging on to things and re-going over them again and the last one that came to mind if i may is the 
<laughs> is the slow the, the slowness to speak the language part yes mm. but i feel i'm running into is that people don't want to, are are too quick to listen mm. and they jump in and and so i has uh, anyway, mm. it's a personal problem, but I'll take care of it <laughs> <laughs> without doing harm. <laughs> Thank you. Indeed, Noe, I would take what you just mentioned, that last one about r rushing to jump in as a sort of mental unrestraint. Well, uh, uh, what you said about not just being able to listen, that would be mental restraint. Like, uh, are you done? Like I'm gonna listen fully and then respond versus having no restraint and just yeah, jumping right in. Excellent examples, Noe. And indeed, this is straight um precept morality type things. Um there's sort of um a little bit of a echo of the eightfold path. And the the echo will be even louder when we come to the next one. Because uh, what more is to be done beyond just those four things? Well, because you should also train thus, thinking our livelihood shall be purified, clear and open, flawless and restrained, and we will not laud ourselves and disparage others on account of that purified livelihood. So, of course, this idea of ajiva, the promotion of life, <clears throat> is literally this idea of livelihood. A problem with that language, um, as I see it, is that in the modern Western vernacular, livelihood equals job. And it's kind of important to understand that at the time of the Buddha, around 500 BC or so, the modern idea of a job is not really applicable in that way. When the Buddhists are talking about livelihood, they are talking about how do you eat every day? How do you survive every day? That's livelihood. Literally, how do you stay alive every day? Now, for many, most modern people, that's a job. <laughs> and so I understand the conflation of livelihood and occupation in, again, in like modern, in the modern vernacular. But at the time of the Buddha, it was livelihood meant how do you survive every day? And the right livelihood and this is part of the Noble Eightfold Path, right livelihood. Well, the right way to survive every day, according to early Buddhism, was to beg for food every day. And specifically to beg for food every day. And what I mean is, is that there are originally there are rules against leftovers, meaning you can't have leftovers. It was a part of the rule that, no, 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 you have to go humble yourself every day and ask and beg for food. That's the right way to survive. That's right livelihood. Now, I'm giving you the very early, formal, official Taheravada definition of right livelihood, which is about begging in that way. This idea here... Um, you know, this we, we don't get much more details on livelihood in this. But again, I think that that might be good because it doesn't box it into just being a monastic or a recluse. And at that point, as householders, we can read this as well and be like, okay. And then we could interpret it in that kind of more modern Buddhist way about right livelihood means does my livelihood, does my occupation or does my job require me to lie? <laughs> does it require me to cheat, steal, kill? If it doesn't, then the modern Buddhist understanding is that it's a right livelihood. If you aren't required to break precepts to do your livelihood, that's sort of the modern interpretation that I've heard. So... 
<clears throat> now, the th main thing, or for tonight, the main thing about livelihood in the early Buddhist tradition, the basic idea was to, to search for enlightenment, to seek liberation. It's a full-time job. And the point is, is that in because it's a full-time occupation seeking enlightenment, I kind of can't have like a job that's making me do all these other things. And then like when I clock out at five, I can now do some meditation. The idea in early Buddhism of becoming a shramana in the sense of a, a renunciant or recluse, it was that you, you had to devote yourself to this a hundred percent. And therefore your right livelihood, or I should say your livelihood, it needs to it needs to be conducive to awakening. In fact, all of this, going all the way back to the idea of having dignity and a fear of wrongdoing, purity of body, speech, and mind, and livelihood, these are all necessary requisites for the real work. At least that's like the traditional understanding of what we're reading here. But it doesn't end with just livelihood because there's more work to do. <laughs> and what more is to be done? And now I'm over on page 364. And what more is to be done, bhikkhus? You should train yourself thus, thinking, we will guard the doors of our sense faculties on seeing a form with the eye, we will not grasp at its major characteristics and features. Since if we left the eye faculty unguarded, evil unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade us. We will practice the way of its restraint. We will guard the eye faculty. We will undertake the restraint of the eye faculty. And also on hearing a sound with the ear or on smelling an odor with the nose or on tasting a flavor with the tongue or on touching a tangible with the body or cognizing a dharma, a mind object with the mind. In all of those cases, we will not grasp at its signs, its characteristics and features, since if we left the mind faculty unguarded, evil, unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade us. We will practice the way of its restraint. We will guard the mind faculty. We will undertake the restraint of the mind faculty. But bhikkhus don't think that's all that's to be done. All right. Now, again, as like preparatory, everything that we've just talked about is understood to be kind of like necessary preparation in order for you to properly guard the indriyas, they're called, the sense faculties. So what we're talking about here is actually not meditation. Or at least I do not understand this. I say that because meditation comes a little bit later, or at least what we would traditionally call meditation. So this is re restraint of the senses, guarding the sense doors. This is all the time. And the idea here is, is that normally the default mode for most sentient beings is whatever visible objects appear, ooh, 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 ooh. Whatever sound, ooh, what's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? Whatever smells, whatever flavors, 
whatever feelings with the body, and then certainly whatever pops into the mind, we're just like, woo, woo, what was that? And this is sort of like, you know, the, the classic yoga analogy of the chariot with the horses. And the horses are just running wild. And the mind is up there at the helm and is just, woo, whoa, along for the ride. Whereas a shramana, a, a recluse, practices this guarding and kind of controlling of the senses so that it is not, ooh, what was that? What was that? But it is mindful and focused and able to direct the mind to look at what it would like to look at. Able to direct the mind to listen to what it would like to listen to and not be distracted by every sound that comes along. This is what is being called guarding the sense doors, guarding the indriyas. And again, it's not exactly this kind of uh, uh, pratyahara this kind of withdrawing of the senses in like that you might find in the yoga tradition. This is no, your eyes are wide open. Your ears are there, but you are being mindful about basically being distracted, easily distracted and developing this kind of um, mindfulness of the senses in that way. Everybody doing okay with that? Cool. What more is to be done, bhikkhus? Well, you should also train thus. We will be moderate in eating. Reflecting wisely, we will take food neither for amusement, nor for intoxication, nor for the sake of physical beauty and attractiveness, but only for the endurance and continuance of this body for ending discomfort, and for assisting the holy life. Considering this way, thus I shall terminate old feelings without arousing new feelings, and I shall be healthy and blameless and shall live in comfort. But bhikkhus, just because you have all of those things, don't think that that's all is to be done. All right, so classic, classic Buddhist kind of um, virtue is this idea of being moderate in eating. It's one of those aspects of the middle path that is often spoken about. You may be aware of it, or you might have heard of it, that when the Buddha, uh, when Siddhartha renounced, and when he became a wanderer, became a shramana, he took up the practice that was common, which was the practice of fasting, not eating, and trying not to eat at all. And then when he became awakened, he sort of, the Buddha is said to have realized this kind of middle path between all extremes. And those two extremes regarding eating is basically fasting to the point of death, basically, or the kind of all-you-can-eat buffet of the palace. And so the Buddha sort of settled on this idea of like, how about one modest meal a day? And let's make let's not make a big deal out of it. <laughs> Meaning like, let's not turn it into this big virtue fast of like fasting. Let's just do it to maintain the body to stay healthy, not to become attractive, not to become intoxicated, but just to maintain the body. That's the early Buddhist kind of approach to food and eating. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say that it's a necessary part of the Buddhist tradition, or at least all of the traditions I've been exposed to, not all of them kind of focus on food this way, but it was certainly part of the early Buddhist tradition to be very moderate in uh, consumption in that way. I don't think that's probably a big surprise to anybody out there. Okay, 
So let's say that you're moderate in your eating, you're well restrained in your senses and all of that. What else is there to do? Well, because you should also train this way. We will be devoted to wakefulness during the day while walking back and forth and sitting we will purify our minds of obstructive states then at night during the first watch of the night while walking back and forth and sitting we will purify our minds of obstructive states in the middle watch of the night we will lie down on our right side in the lion's pose with one foot overlapping the other mindful and fully aware, after noting in our minds the time for rising. After rising, in the third watch of the night, while walking back and forth and sitting, we will purify our minds of obstructive states. Now, you might think that's all there is to do it, but there's more. So this is also pretty classic here. Um, if most of the longer uh, meditation retreats that I've done have followed this schedule, as far as certainly being awake during the day, but then even during the evening, doing evening walking meditation and evening sitting, and then even in the monastery I was living in, we were advised to do the simhasana, as it's called, the lion's pose. You've seen the Buddha doing it, laying on right side with his hands under his head and elongated or, you know, with his body flat. That's the lion's pose. That is a meditative posture. And basically what was being advised here, especially during the second watch of the night. So we'll, we'll lie down on our right side in the lion's pose. We'll be mindful and fully aware after noting in our minds the time for rising. And then in the third watch, we rise. And that little thing there is actually really, I wouldn't say it's important, but it's actually a big part of the Buddhist meditation tradition. It's that ability to, send, to set a mental clock and to be able to then move into either a meditative state or a, a sleep state, but to then like willingly, knowingly come out of that state at the exact time that you meant to in that way. And what that does is it basically, if you're good at it, and it's kind of what I think they're suggesting here, you can basically get into it where you are maintaining essentially a constant state of awareness all the time even though you're dipping in in the in the second watch of the night you're dipping into this kind of what could be called sleep but it is so again like mindful of you're going into it and mindful of coming out of it that it is this kind of practice of wakefulness and again, I don't know uh, who out there has done long meditation retreats, but if you've done like a 10-day Goenka or if you've done a long retreat, you've probably had the experience where your waking state starts to get a little dreamy and your dream state starts to get a little wakey, if you will, um, meaning that like you kind of stop sleeping and dreaming and you're so mentally rested from all the meditation that you don't really need to go to sleep. You just sort of need to rest a little bit. And then all of a sudden they're knocking the bells and you're getting, you're up meditating again. So that's been my experience of wakefulness. And it's again, part of the tradition. And now if we've cultivated such restraint of the senses, such moderation in eating, and such wakefulness, what else is there to be, what else is to be done? Well, bhikkhus, you should also train thus, thinking, 
we will be possessed of mindfulness and full awareness. We will act in full awareness when going forward and returning. We will act in full awareness when looking ahead and looking away. We will act in full awareness when flexing and extending our limbs. We will act in full awareness when wearing our robes and carrying our outer robe and bowl. We will act in full awareness when eating, drinking, consuming food, and tasting. We will act in full awareness when defecating and urinating. We will act in full awareness when walking, standing, sitting, falling down, falling asleep, waking up, talking, and keeping silent. And you might think that that's it, but there's more. <laughs> All right. So this is, of course, a big part of the Buddhist practice, cultivating what is known as full awareness, full bodily awareness. I could say a lot about this, but I just want to mention kind of one aspect of it. And what it is, is it's about um, noticing like you could call it like ticks or uncontrollable physical behavior in that way. And the idea here is, is that, you know, you might have a habit of like, I don't know, tapping your foot nervously, right? And then the idea is, is that you might be engaged in something over here and then all of a sudden realize that your, your foot is nervously tapping. That is not being fully bodily aware. That's actually being very divided and having your mind over here while the body's over here doing something entirely different. Versus the cultivation of full bodily awareness where you are always mindfully aware of the entirety of your body and what it's doing and in a way what the karmic effects are of what you are doing in that way and even to the point you will notice even to the point when you are urinating and defecating you're aware of those bowel movements i mean there's a there was a book a funny book it is kind of a funny book uh back in the 90s called a uh, zen and the art of bowel movements and it was about being aware of the digestive tract and that full bodily awareness and one of the things about full bodily awareness, if you start cultivating it, you begin to realize how little mindful bodily awareness you have. And you realize how in a way alienated and divorced you are from your own being in that sense. And that's an impetus to practice more in that way. All right. If you can do all of that, those are all sort of these preparatory uh, cultivations in order to, well, what more is to be done? Well, Bhikkhu is a Bhikkhu resorts to a secluded resting place. The forest, the root of a tree, a mountain, a ravine, a hillside cave, a charnel ground, a jungle thicket, an open space or a heap of straw. And after your moderate meal, so after returning from alms round, after meal, one sits down, folds one's legs crosswise, and sits with body erect, establishing mindfulness in front of them. Abandoning desire, covetousness for the world, one abides with a mind free from covetousness. One purifies the mind from covetousness. Abandoning ill will, bitter resentment, and hatred, one abides with a mind free from ill will compassionate for the welfare of all living beings. One purifies the mind of all ill will and hatred. Abandoning sloth and torpor, one abides free of sloth and torpor. Percipient of light, 
mindful and fully aware, one purifies the mind of sloth and torpor. Abandoning anxiety, abandoning restlessness and worry, one abides unagitated with a mind inwardly peaceful. One purifies the mind from restlessness and worry. Abandoning doubt, one abides having gone beyond doubt, unperplexed about wholesome states. One purifies their mind of doubt. Bhikkhus, suppose someone took a loan out to undertake a business, and the business was successful, so that they could repay all the money of the old loan, and there could remain enough extra to maintain a spouse. Then, on considering this, one would be glad and full of joy. Or suppose somebody was afflicted, suffering, and gravely ill, and their food would not agree with them, and their body had no strength. But later on, they recover from the affliction, <clears throat> and food would agree with them, and their body would regain their strength. Then, on considering this, they would be glad and full of joy. Or suppose there was somebody imprisoned in a prison house, but later they were released from prison, safe and secure, with no loss to their property. Then on considering this, they would be glad and full of joy. Or suppose there was somebody who was a slave, not, de not self-dependent, but dependent upon others, unable to go where they wanted. But later on, they were released from slavery, self-dependent, independent of others, a freed person able to go wherever they want. Then on considering this, they would be glad and they would be joyful. Or suppose somebody with wealth and property were to enter a road across a desert, but later on they get across and they're safe and secure with no loss to their property. Then on considering this, they would be glad and full of joy. So too, bhikkhus, a bhikkhu, so too, bhikkhus, when these five hindrances are abandoned, a bhikkhu sees themselves respectively as, a, as that debtor or as a disease, as a prison house, slavery, and a road across a desert. So they see themselves just like those other people. But when these five hindrances have been abandoned, they see that they are free from debt. They're healthy. They're released from prison. They're free from slavery. And they're in a safe land. <clears throat> okay, so those are, of course, the five hindrances. We've done a whole night on the five hindrances. We did a whole sutra on the five hindrances. These are, of course, hindrances. <laughs> They're weighing us down. <laughs> They're holding us back. So this kind of, you know, I, I just call it addiction, but this desirousness, this covetousness, this bitter ill will, the anger, right? Laziness, anxiety, and doubt. Those five hindrances are holding you back. They're, they're weighing you down. And it's like either being sick or being in debt or being a slave or being in prison. And if you get free of those five hindrances, it's like being freed from jail. It's like being, it's like getting over a disease. Now, the one that I want to talk about real quick, because it has a lot to do with tonight. I want to talk about the fifth hindrance of doubt. In particular, this has this particular language of that the practitioner here abides having gone beyond doubt, unperplexed about wholesome states. It's a really simple, clear definition of what doubt means. Allow me just to kind of elaborate. So take something like drinking, intoxication. It's fun. I know. I've been there. I've had the fun in that way. And for a very long time, I was doubtful that it mattered. 
just being honest, for a very long time, I was a Buddhist practitioner where I was doubtful that it mattered. That And only years after ceasing that behavior, do I look back and go, oh, I was so confused. I didn't understand. I was perplexed about wholesome states. I, I honestly didn't understand what that meant to be wholesome in that way, to be pure in that way. And it's like, oh, but now I get it. Now I have no doubt that basically alcohol is poison and you might as well just hit yourself in the head with a brick. Like it, it kind of amounts to the same thing. And just as I would not now hit myself in the head with a brick because I just wouldn't see the advantage to it. And I just, it would seem silly. Poisoning myself now seems silly in that way. But again, I'm being honest about a state of doubt. And But what it means to have doubt, which was, I was like, really, Buddha? Like, really? Come on. And then I realized. So that's sort of just one quick little example of what, how I understand doubt in its relation to the five hindrances. You could also see, by the way, how that being uncertain about it was holding me back in that way. It was truly a hindrance in that sense. So now, really quickly, unless there's any comments, questions, ideas. So all of that, abandoning the hindrances, and remember, the hindrances are just the things that are holding you back. It's, it's not, you're not enlightened just because you get rid of the hindrances. You've just taken off all of the weights. <laughs> if you can do that, then there's more work to do. And on page 367, paragraph 15, having abandoned these five hindrances, imperfections of the mind that weaken wisdom, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, one enters and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by vitarka and vichaya, right? Looking around and contemplation is also with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. Now, because of the time, I want you to know, of course, that we then are then allowed to enter into the second jhana, and then into the third jhana, and then finally into the fourth jhana. And then, and this is all, by the way, I don't mind skipping this because it's the classic formula that I've read many, many nights on Dharma doors. It's always the same formula, especially for the jhanas. So just insert jhana dharma talk here in that way. And by the way, that includes what happens to you if you successfully cultivate the four jhanas. That leads to the acquisition of these three knowledges, right? And this is this kind of uh, knowledge of past lives, knowledge of other people's future lives and future rebirths. And depending on this list... Uh, yeah, so it's the divine eye that gets to see where people are going to be reborn. It's recollection of past lives. And it is knowledge of destructions of the taints, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so again, classic formula, classic description of the Buddhist process to awakening or enlightenment. So that goes all the way to the end of page 370. And... I really, because of the time, I just want to share with you the end of this. So the Buddha concludes this sutra by saying bhikkhus. A bhikkhu such as this that has gone through this whole process we've talked about this evening. A bhikkhu such as this is called a shramana, a brahmin, one who has been washed, one who has attained knowledge. 
a holy scholar, a noble one, an arahat. <clears throat> and how is a bhikkhu a shramana? How is a bhikkhu a recluse? The bhikkhu has quieted down evil, unwholesome states that defile, bring renewal of being, give trouble, ripen in suffering, and lead to future birth, aging, and death. That's how a bhikkhu is a recluse. By having quieted down evil, unwholesome states that defile and lead to future rebirth. And how is a bhikkhu a Brahmin? A bhikkhu has expelled evil, unwholesome states that defile and so on and so forth and lead to future rebirth. So a bhikkhu is a shramana because they have quieted down evil, unwholesome states. They're a Brahmin because they've expelled evil, unwholesome states. And how is a bhikkhu one who has been washed? A bhikkhu has washed off evil, unwholesome states that defile and lead to future rebirth. And how is a bhikkhu one who has attained to knowledge? The bhikkhu has known evil, unwholesome states that defile and lead to future rebirth. That's how a bhikkhu is known as one who has attained to knowledge. How is a bhikkhu a holy scholar? The evil, unwholesome states that, that defile and lead to future birth, aging, and death have streamed away from the bhikkhu. That's how a bhikkhu is a holy scholar. And how is a bhikkhu a noble one? An Arya, evil, unwholesome states that defile and lead to future birth, aging, and death are far away from them. That's how a bhikkhu is a noble one. And how is a bhikkhu an Arahat? Evil, unwholesome states that defile, bring renewal of being, give trouble, ripen in suffering, and lead to future birth, aging, and death are far away from them. That's how a bhikkhu is an arahat. And that's what the Blessed One said. And the bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. All right. So I just wanted to kind of share that last the little bit, the last like language. In particular, I was interested personally in the one of being washed away because you kind of have this kind of um, kind of baptism type thing going on with that, which, you know, rather than reading this as a baptism, you could read baptism as a form of this, right? I think that would be an interesting read, but any questions or ideas, comments about the sutra tonight? Again, and it was kind of a classic in that way of just, you know, what it's what it means to be a practitioner, the lifestyle, the mentality. Yeah. Cool. And the bhikkhus were delighted. Yeah, no. It's not really a comment or a question, but uh, thank you. That was beautiful. And uh, I wonder, it, 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 it seems like the topic of right livelihood I don't remember ever doing a sutra on that. That'd be a fascinating topic for uh, for Dharma doors. I felt mm -hmm. like a lot of ideas, things came up when you were talking about that. So. Duly noted. I will find a good sutra and do that one. Hey, thank you. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. As always, I appreciate it so much.